Boston. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Stacy Thayer, founder and executive director of Source Conference. Um, and standing behind me is our advisory board. Um, they're here to help answer any questions, and they assist me with basically the formation and vision of the entire conference. Um, so just a few, few items of note, uh, so you know for the rest of the conference. Um, if you need anything at any time, our staff badges, um, they're in red. Stop, ask someone, we'll have an information desk, uh, we'll have the registration desk. So if you need to know where any rooms are, if you need anything, just stop and ask one of our uh, staff members identified by the red tag on their badges. Uh, other item, all panel sessions will be held in this room. So even though if you look in your guidebook, um, we've assigned the room by track, except for the panel sessions as marked by an asterisk, they'll be held in this room. Um, Please, uh, we will have one staff member in each room. Um, they'll be there to do the video and also to collect feedback forms. For each feedback form, return to a staff member, return to um, the registration desk, or return to uh, the information desk. We'll be donating five cents to um, the Kingpin Empire Hacker Charity. So please fill out those feedback forms. We do look at them. We do give them to our speakers. And uh, you will be helping out uh, charity for that. Um, t-shirts, source t-shirts, will be available for purchase either in the, um, at the registration desk or we'll have a uh, table downstairs in the exhibit hall, which we hope you will visit. Uh, and we also, that. Um, trivia form that is in there that can be returned to either the registration desk or uh, the information desk. So basically, if you need anything, information desk, registration desk, staff badges in red. Um, thank you all. That's pretty much all the notes that I have, little add-ons. Um, I'm going to hand this over now then to Rafi to introduce uh, Peter Cooper, but thank you all for coming. I hope to get a chance to speak with all of you. Stop and ask me for anything if you need anything, and have a great time. Thanks, guys. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Source. It's my pleasure to introduce the first keynote to you, Peter Cooper. He comes from a financial industries background. He has worked at Morgan Stanley most recently as the lead uh, software analyst for them. It's always interesting to talk to Peter. He has a very unique kind of view of our industry from a financial perspective and not the technical perspective like most of us. He's been a friend of mine for a number of years at this point and whenever I come to Boston I, I make sure that I hook up with him and uh, get a couple of drinks to hear the latest stories from the financial market. He knows pretty much everything about IPOs happening in our market, about mergers and acquisitions, why stocks move up and down. For example, a pretty interesting stock that moved up 30 percent last Friday, which I was very surprised about. He had a good explanation. Um, based on discussions last night, late, um, I'm really looking forward to his talk today. He's going to talk about the current markets and what it means to all of us. Peter? So why don't we just get going? So I know we're a little behind schedule, so I'll just go uh, with this for now. And um, what I want to do is leave some time for Q&A, because that's kind of the fun part, right? See what you guys want to talk about. What do you want to know? If I can answer it, I will. If I can't, I will try to find out for you later on. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go here. Let's go. Is this not going to work now? There it goes. OK. So a couple of things. The economy out there is not particularly good, right? We talk about that all day long. Um, in fact, it's, uh, it's pretty bad. Um, it's really tough out there. We know all of this. It's getting worse. There's no immediate sign of recovery. Thank you very much. All these microphones. Um, and uh, it's not going to get better anytime soon, unfortunately. There's a lot going on. Uh, you're seeing layoffs. We all know about unemployment. That's moving up. That's not good. Uh, we have um, now corporations trying to figure out where they're going to cut expenses across the board. And it literally is becoming an arbitrary cut. Just they're going to people and saying, you've got to figure out where 20% comes out somewhere. You all figure out amongst yourselves, whether it be IT, be it human resources, 
20% is kind of the number I'm hearing all over the place. Um, and why? Well, that chart in the bottom kind of tells you what's going on from the unemployment point of view. It's spiking. It's uh, roughly a 10-year chart. And you can see in the last recession we had, back in the 0102 time frame, it, it jumped up. <clears throat> uh, the, so it hit about six and a quarter percent, I believe, 6.2%. Now we're heading to eight. I think we're heading to over 10% reported. And that's a U.S. government reported number, which means the actual number more like 12 to 14%. Because once you exhaust your unemployment benefits, you are no longer unemployed according to the U.S. government. Fantastic way to treat the numbers. <laughs> this is what they do. It's not 10% unemployment, Cooper. It's 9.9%. Yeah, let's add in all the guys that actually don't have any money at all because they, their checks ran out. That's not fun. So unemployment's really bad. Um, and uh, it's going to stay bad for some time. These things take a while to cycle through. And this is where I love my, my country, I love my government less, um, because they are kind of the reason why we're in the jam that we're in. When you give out cheap money with very little re repercussions for spending that money inappropriately, uh, you'll do it all day long. And um, as a result, you're going to look for inflation to kick in as well. And I, I use the word rampant. Is Marcus here? Is Raynham here? Yes. I had hyperinflation and Marcus freaked out on me. I was like, so let's not use hyperinflation like a South American economy, but we'll talk about rampant inflation instead for now. Um, <laughs> so the good. So here, here's the good news. All right, I can talk about how bad it is, and I'm going to throw a lot of slides at you that will kind of validate from a data perspective why it is that bad. And I'll try to not block you guys seeing it there. Uh, but the good news is this kind of had to happen. This is a natural market cycle. You're supposed to get rid of the weak, right? The recession's supposed to clean out the bad, make it easier or more advantageous for the stronger, more able, more capable, be it an employee, be it a company, be it whatever. Um, so this actually is a good thing if you look at it in that perspective. And then um, on the other hand, uh, you know, you got to think about while it's negative out there, you know, it's raining today, you know, what are you going to do when the clouds break? How are you going to position yourself today, either you individually, let me talk about like Susie Orman, you know, just pay off your debt, like, you know, or you as a corporation, right? Seriously, I mean, this is the time to do it is right now. And it's never too late by because, oh, you're going to miss it. You're not going to miss it. <laughs> it's going to take a lo long time to get through this. So the good news is you have time. The bad news is you have time. Um, so let's talk about the macro stuff real, real quickly here. This chart here tracks um, uh, corporate spending versus U.S. GDP. The blue line is corporate spending. And um, the magenta line, interesting color, Samson, is um, uh, we'll be looking at U.S. domestic product, what we're growing or not growing. So the colored areas, the gray bars, rather, are a recession. What's interesting to me from this slide, from a software point of view, if you uh, look at it this way, software actually was going down ahead of the recession in almost every single case, right? Just look at the lines, those little red arrows, try to highlight that for you. Software's going down, software's going down, um, and then all of a sudden, this last recession, software was going up. It actually was increasing into the recession, which is a really interesting dynamic. People were spending on software, and I think the reason is because the productivity gains of software gave people reason to still invest. So security investing, right, has been up every single year except for this year. <laughs> it's going to be flat, it looks like, uh, which is actually relatively up relative to others that are getting slashed. But the fact of the matter is that people are still looking for software solutions to make them more competitive, make them more efficient. So that's a very positive silver lining in the otherwise very bleak picture, and you probably can't see it, but that GDP growth is, is jumping down there, uh, very negative, and it's going to keep going down for a little bit more time here. Uh, talk about software here. Overall, while I said software spending in, you can see how it, it went up there, again, heading into the recession, but it's also coming down. It is coming down, so it's be a little harder as a provider of software to compete to get those dollars because there are fewer dollars to get. And the trend line for software, that little dotted line, that's also in a downward slope. That's not good for the software industry as well. Um, this, by the way, is all U.S. government data, and I, Stacey will have a copy of the slides. If you guys need more backup on this stuff, just email me, and I'll, I'll get you whatever you need so you have it. Um, but the, the take is here that it's, it's still it's going to get worse for a little bit. This is, we're not out of the woods yet. Um, and let's talk about the stock market. Are we talking about 401ks? Now talking about 201ks? Now talking about 20ks? It's not good. Um, but the good news is, quote unquote, we're not alone. So that chart in the bottom is the Dow Jones World uh, Index, basically, lack of a better term. It's taking a bunch of different stocks from around the globe, aggregating them, and you can see the drop off there. Just a nasty, nasty fall. Um, so it's every economy is, is feeling the pain here, not just the U.S. Um, and that, again, prolongs the recovery, because who's going to pull us out of it? It actually looks like people are looking to the U.S. to pull us out. That's a bit of an uh, issue. Um, assets of every class are resetting. You know, if you own a home, you know your house is worth less. If you own any type of commodity or anything, it's going to be worth less. Um, and the reason why, though, is asking what is going on, like oil is down 70%. 
The reason why, it's really just one word. It comes down to one reason why. It's deleverage. There was too much borrowing in the system, in the global economy. There was too much cheap money available. I remember at Morgan Stanley, I would put a sell on a stock like Salesforce.com, not because Mark Benioff is an asshole, which he is, but because it was an overvalued, stupid game that people were playing. Because an investor would say to me, Cooper, I actually agree with you. Salesforce.com is overvalued. But the issue is, you're trying to short into a market where there's so much money chasing so few quote unquote growth stories, relatively speaking, you're going to be wrong for a while. And I was wrong for a while. Eventually I was right and it came crashing down. And the problem is, again, because every hedge fund was out there to say, okay, I want to invest $50 million as a hedge fund manager. You would get eight to one leverage on that money. So you now have $400 million to invest. You literally could go out and buy $400 million of stock with just 50 million bucks. And then here's the best part on top of that. The banks would actually go out there and lever it up again. And they would go out there and borrow and lever. AIG, I don't know if you look at AIG, we'll talk about that in a second. I mean, the amount of money that they owe is staggering. That's why we've already given $160 billion. Because the credit default swaps, the CDS, very bad, bad board. This is where Warren Buffett talk about financial weapons of mass destruction. Because when you do these credit default swaps, the amount of collateral you have to put up is so small versus your liability that could literally be leverage of 320 to 1. So if you let me a dollar, theoretically, through contracts, or derivatives, and other relationships, I could actually be effectively borrowing or leveraging $320 for that $1 you gave me. And that's the problem, because everybody goes, Cooper, I need my dollar back. I'm like, you need it now? I'm like, yeah, I need it now. I'm like, it's like a bad mob movie. I'm like, oh, uh, I don't have it. Well, I need to get it. All right, let me go find it. So I go to Lehman Brothers. You have it? No, we don't have it. <laughs> Bear Stearns, you got it? Uh, we don't got it. Citibank, uh, we can't talk to you right now. Nobody has the money because they all relevered it to the other parties. So now we're looking around going, who owes who what, and where do I get my dollar? At the end of the day, where is the dollar? It's like, like a shell game, you know, like in New York City. You, you, don't, you can't find it. So the market is basically trying to unwind all this leverage, and it's very painful, and it's going to take some time here. Um, and here's the problem. The U.S. government is now making this all look easy because they're just going to spend money. They've already spent $11 trillion in commitments that we can identify. And this is not my number, by the way, it's the New York Times. 9.1 trillion is committed, 2.6 trillion has already been spent. And where is it going? You know where it's going. It's going to keep going up because AIG and Citibank and what have you. Um, and my take is quite simply, is a very kind of silly thing to say, but quite honestly, the global financial system is basically bankrupt. These guys overborrowed on asset classes that are coming down, they cannot collect on the debt. And therefore, they don't have the money in the system to actually do it. If everybody went to the bank today and pulled out their money, the financial system would collapse instantly. That's the classic run on the bank. The problem is it's not just a couple of small banks here in the U.S. It's actually the global financial system. I mean, Iceland lately? Yeah. Right? I haven't been. How, how bad is it? Uh, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. Right? What's the currency? 80% down? 85% devaluation of the currency. Just nasty, nasty stuff. Uh, the British pound has come way in relative to the dollar. Just go around the line. And the, US, the U.K. is now nationalizing their banks. We, by the way, <laughs> are nationalizing our banks. Um, <laughs> we are. If you don't believe me, uh, they are. Uh, because we already own 78% uh, of AIG, which, by the way, is a penny stock, literally. And we own 36 of Citibank. That's why I love the stock market. Stock market was up 55 to 6% yesterday because Citibank CEO said that we're going to make money this quarter. That's fantastic. So do I get a check from Citibank as a taxpayer to get me a refund off of the money they're making? Because they're basically lending for free because there's no cost of borrowing. You all take out a loan for a car, a house, whatever, you've got to pay an interest rate. Citibank is basically getting a zero effective rate because we're giving them the money. So you're borrowing from Citibank the money you gave them for free. It's, think about that for a second. I don't really get you going. And why is this happening? Again, it's because we <laughs> borrowed too much. <laughs> you all see Monty Python, obviously. Um, and the, the reason why I get very frustrated with the government and it gets me all fired up is because they're trying to do the old game, which is, you know, even Obama said it the other day, oh, consumers just have to not worry and just go out and spend. Bush said the same thing. The fact that Obama and Bush have a similar message, you should all be very worried. <laughs> I am. Um, <laughs> uh, but the problem is, again, there's too much debt. People are looking at the red line here in the chart, sorry, I was just pointing out, um, that's real household debt. You can see how high it got and how it's coming right down now. And the other line, the green line, is personal savings rate, which, by the way, is starting to go back up. So the next quarter data, we'll get another couple of weeks when this, this month closes out. I would expect those lines to really start to converge. So people are really reining in the spending, which, by the way, to me is a good thing. I know it's bad for the economy, quote unquote, but it's a good thing. You could not keep possibly going, taking 100 grand out of your house that was overvalued to begin with, leasing a new BMW, and taking a trip to Aruba. 
This is not exactly a strong economic foundation, folks. I'm sorry. It doesn't work that way. Again, where is the dollar? You owe that 100 grand on your house now. And you go to sell your house, and it's worth 100 grand less. And the bank said, yeah, you want to sell your house, but you owe me 100K. Where are you getting the 100K from? Well, how about my BMW? Well, it's leased, so you can't take that. So what are you going to do? They're going to foreclose on you. And that's why foreclosure rates are up. I don't even have a chart on that, but you know the foreclosure rate is... Um, well, actually, I do have a chart on that. I take that back. <laughs> sorry. There it is. So this slide right here... Uh, oh, the colors did not come out well. Sorry. Um, this chart right here talks about consumer default rates, meaning that you don't pay your bill and the bank basically writes it off, says they're not going to pay me, I need to foreclose on their house. So the yellow line is the single family mortgage, and it came out really poorly, I apologize. But basically, I'll stand over here for a second, the yellow line is now up to here, over 5% default for consumer uh, single family mortgages, the homes, right? The highest it was before was 3.4 something percent. Now it's spiked all the way to 5 plus percent and going higher. That's really, really bad, right? But here's the funny part, or the really bad part is, the credit card number hasn't even hit the new high, the old high. That dotted line represents where credit cards were, but again, back in the same time frame, five and a half percent. We're, we're heading towards it in a hurry here, but it's gonna go through it, guaranteed. Well, not guaranteed, can't say that. It's likely going to go through that. So you're gonna see credit cards starting to default. So if you own Capital One as an investment, think about that for a second. They have a $121 billion credit card slash lending facility. They're on the hook for $121 billion They're looking for Americans to pay back. Target, you know, Target, the store, $9.1 billion in credit card receivables. $9 billion, people going to Target. What do you buy at Target that's worth $9 billion? For the love of God, do you really need it? <laughs> Seriously. I, I, I was short Target, by the way. I had fun with that one. Um, but the point of the matter is, you see the dotted line, until we start breaking those highs, that'll be a hint to you that we're getting close to the bottom. Everybody asks, what's the market bottom? Jim Cramer screaming every night, last night on TV, his recipe for a market rally. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the John Stewart rant on CNBC. Oh, you got to see it. That's a great one. He goes, the, basically the summary line is, if I watched and listened to CNBC, I'd be worth a million dollars today, provided I start with a hundred million dollars. <laughs> it's largely true. Um, but the point of the matter is, when you're looking for a bottom, what I do as an analyst, I look at this kind of data, and I realize that until the consumer totally tops out, we're not out of the woods. Why is that? Well, let me show you a slide for that, too. Click, please. Go. There we go. Okay. As the consumer goes, so goes tech. And again, this chart is very busy. It didn't come out very well, and I'll make sure you have a copy of this. But the, the summary is that the uh, black line is consumer expenditures, consumer consumption, right? What people are spending money on, the growth rate of that. And you can see on, it's the black, it's the, uh, black line, black scale on the right-hand side. And it's been as high as in the 80s. It was up to 12%, uh, actually a little over 12%. And then it's getting down now in the um, latest data, like negative 17, I think, percent, something like that. And the interesting thing from this chart point of view, all you need to realize is that corporate IT is actually follows that line almost perfectly. Every time consumer dives down, corporate IT follows it. Hence the little circles around those things help you see them a little more readily. So until the consumer bottoms, unfortunately, we're not getting out of this. So when Obama and Cruz say the consumer should spend, I know why they're saying it. They're, they, they look at the same data here, a lot more than I get my hands on, admittedly. And they say, look, if the consumer doesn't come back, what's going to come back? The problem is the consumer can't spend, so that's why it's going to take a lot longer. It's a resetting here. The consumer needs to reset their debt, reset their savings, and a lot of system has to, the system itself has to reset. Do we need yet another mall? Do we need yet another car in the driveway, right? You do, I don't know. You need another restaurant to go to. So there's this whole attitude, is the consumer behavior resetting? If that actually could prolong the recession a lot longer than people want to talk about. So now to the good stuff. <laughs> All this bad. Basically, cash is king is the, is the easy talk. I gave a talk down at Ions DC last week. Cash is king was the, the, one of the points I made, and, and some of the CSOs just said that point blank. They agree that cash is king, right? And that goes for every, every constituent, sorry, be it the buyer. If you're a buyer, you want to do a cash deal, I don't care what you're talking about. If you want to buy anything, you have cash, you're getting a deal. A car, a house, whatever it is, a new appliance, be it your refrigerator or a firewall, you're going to get a good deal. Because you have the money for it, people want to use it. If you're a seller, you have an opportunity to gain ground if you can afford to give a better discount and get that cash. Inventors or entrepreneurs, there's a huge opportunity here. And I'm going to spend a little time on this in a minute. Um, and investors, well, they got the biggest hand of all because if they have the cash to invest in a company, they can pretty much dictate whatever terms they want to a point because even the VCs are still raising money. Bessemer raised $370 million. Um, uh, oh, shoot. Who else? Somebody just raised $280-something million dollars local here, Atlas, I think. So there's still money being raised out there to be invested in companies that we can talk about as well. Um, but again, it's about what are you going to do with your position of strength and how do you get to that position of strength if you're not there. 
So three main trends, commoditization. Think about that as a lack of pricing power because assets are being lowered across the board. That trickles into IT, trickles into your home value as well. So you're looking to buy a house, great time to be buying. I'm not saying today, but great time to be looking. Consolidation, look for that to actually re-accelerate. Uh, re and capitulation, again, that consumer data that I, I mentioned earlier, look for that to really get through the roof before we can talk about a bottom. Then I'll, I'll feel good about talking about a bottom. So the buyers, I'll just go this very quickly here. Basically, maintenance is the Achilles heel for a vendor. They cannot afford to lose you as a customer in this, market, in this environment, and they're going to be willing to discount. They just are. And the business room are going, I hate when he says this, but it's true. Right? If you're a Blue Coat customer, is Blue Coat here? Are they a sponsor? Or I bash somebody? <laughs> if you're a Blue Coat customer, you're paying them half a million dollars a year, that number is grossly overstated by at least 50%. What is the value Blue Coat is providing you to for that 500 k a year? I don't know. All these vendors have to prove their value to you. We were talking earlier, I was having uh, breakfast with Big Fix, and we are talking about the value of uh, like a Walmart, what Walmart is saying. Look, they want partners. Walmart does not want a vendor. They want a partner. How are you helping Walmart be more competitive, be more cost efficient? If you can do that, and maybe something as silly, as, well, not silly, but something as arbitrary as saving them power, that actually may mean something to a Walmart. It may mean something to somebody else. So as a buyer, you've got to get more out of that value. You've got to extract value from your vendors, and, and you should do that, no question about it. Um, and play them against each other. Semantic McAfee, I'm going to talk about that in a second, how they beat each other up all the time in the market. Um, you know, look at other vendors to use as a way to say, look, to a Symantec uh, or a McAfee, you know, Postini looks pretty good. I might go to Postini unless you guys can do a deal for me. Just maybe you never want to outsource your email security. I'm not endorsing one or the other. But if you need to compete with these guys and lever your hand of having cash, throw it at them. Say, look, we're looking at doing this. It's a very real possibility we're going to shop it. If not, go with these guys. Um, and then the hardware vendors, these guys are also feeling it in a big way. So Checkpoint versus Cisco versus Juniper versus Sun. Get in these guys' heads. Say, look, we can move. We can move around. And there's other vendors out there for what we're talking about. And here's another fun slide. This is the uh, percent of money that IT is spending in software and hardware. <clears throat> Black line software, red line hardware. Bad trend for hardware guys, right? They're losing share every single year in the budget. So I showed software slowing down in growth. Hardware's dropping through the floor. It, is it was down 16-something percent last quarter. Right, Samson? 18 and a half? Sorry, 18 and a half. <laughs> That's bad. That's not good. That's not good at all if you're a vendor. That's why, oh, who's Nortel anymore? Bankrupt. These guys are getting whacked because they're losing a fifth of their market. It's going smaller and smaller every year, and those numbers kind of bear that out. And talk about com competition here. If you were a McAfee or Symantec investor, and you put in, this is the five-year chart, if you put in 100 bucks in each five years ago, today, even in this market, you would still be up 60% in your McAfee position. So if you put 100 bucks in McAfee five years ago, today that would be worth 160 bucks. If you put the same $100 in Symantec, it would be worth about $55. Why is that? Well, A, the Veritas deal did not go particularly well. We'll talk about that if you want. But essentially, McAfee is taking share from Symantec. It's very simple. So does Symantec like this? Enrique is now taking over, right? Does he like the fact that his chart looks like that and McAfee's look like that? No. So McAfee is now going to watch Symantec try to come at them from a competitive point of view and try to fight back. That is great for a buyer. If you're a buyer and you're a McAfee or Symantec shop, you need to think about this type of uh, slide. This is to your advantage. It is a clear advantage for you as the buyer. Cash is king. And you know what? If GE can worry about Symantec, anybody can worry about Symantec. That's the kind of game that's going on. GE wanted the deal of Symantec. Symantec didn't play. Symantec's out. Simple as that. Click. Um, the other thing about, I found, uh, I work with the IONS guys. I'm a faculty in residence at the Institute for Applied Network Security. In this latest survey, mind you, it's only a survey of 36 people. So it's a very, very small, you may argue, not even relevant survey. However, it validates other surveys I've seen in the market. So I feel good about it. 71% of people think budgets will be flat this year. That's interesting because security's been up every single year. Even um, just a slight bit last year was up anyway. And in prior years, it was up double digits every single year of this decade for the most part, since 02, I think. And now all of a sudden, security is flat. That's not good. So you're being forced to do more with less is the kind of the call here. And going forward, the other problem is next year, it's actually you know, almost, uh, well, a little over a fifth of people expect their budget to be cut uh, in, in a big way by over 10%. That's really bad. We have not seen that in security. To have your budget go down by 10% or more is a problem because you're not used to operating in that way because you haven't had to for almost eight years now. So now somebody's telling you, you know what, I know we gave you $5 million last year. This year it's 4, 4.5. And you want to cut heads? Probably don't. 
where's the budget going to come from? You've got to go back to your vendors and hammer them down. It's, just, it's the self-fulfilling cycle here. So security is actually not immune to the recession is kind of the, the quick and, and uh, easy takeaway from that slide. Um, mentioned maintenance before. I'm actually thinking that at some point you're going to see a nasty reduction in this line. This is, again, U.S. government data, um, and it talks about the inflation-adjusted expense of maintenance versus application licensing. And you can see back in 97, if you start with 100 bucks, that $100 of maintenance today would cost you over $142. And you know why. Remember, maintenance used to be, God, 8%, 10%, and it went to 12%, and then 15% of license fee, and then 18%, and that got to be 20. You're like, oh, my God, 20. We've got to be at the top. Try 25. And then our goes 28. <laughs> it's like, whoa, what is going on here? So no wonder that number's up 40-something percent. It had to happen. And they're discounting very little. You can see the license hasn't really gone up. That's good news, but it hasn't really gone down either. So net-net, you're paying more to the software vendors anyway. And they're getting you every year. Oracle charges you 20% of the list every single quarter. They are getting $6 billion in revenue for maintenance contracts alone. That is $24 billion a year historically speaking, we'll see how it goes going forward, but $24 billion a year of maintenance. That's what Oracle's getting. Now you're getting upgrades. I understand like, it's not that simple, a straightforward argument, but still, are you really getting 40% more value out of your maintenance? And for some vendors, you probably are. Some vendors, I guarantee you're not, and you need to think about that as a buyer. And so do the vendors, by the way. Think about that, too. <clears throat> um, another thing from the IN survey I thought was useful to think about, uh, what do customers want? Well, they want scalability and security. That's almost half of the, in, the, uh, the desires, top two. And the next two are price and maintenance. That's it. They're saying, it's got to work, it's got to be secure, and it can't cost me a ton of money. It's that simple a process, according to this data. <laughs> the uh, analyst and trade recommendation, 3%, by the way. <laughs> Not sure what that means. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that pricing is very important. The quality, of course, is important. And we all know security it either works or it doesn't, for the most part. Uh, but still, the maintenance and pricing was 30%-ish of the priority as they look at criteria for selecting a vendor. So I thought it was useful information to think about what's going on out there. Um, talk about the venture capital model. I don't know if you guys saw this deck, the uh, RIP of the Good Times. Sequoia Ventures put it out, I think, in September, October? I can't remember now. I think October. And it's, it's on the web. I can get, I'll send you a copy if you want to see it. Basically, talk about some of the slides like I have, about consumer credit, things of that nature, how bad it is out there, and how VCs need to rethink their portfolio management which means private companies need to rethink how they run their business. Trying to run a business at a loss for four or five years to try to go public one day, not going to happen. Not acceptable. Cash flow break even is the, is the mantra, mantra right now. In other words, don't cost me any money because as a VC, I don't want to keep throwing good money after good money. I want it to be no more money that's already in and doing well. So make sure you can sustain yourself. So that's one thing uh, from the VC community that's definitely changing. Um, and because they also need to keep their money around in case some of the companies do have a tough time because Back in October, I talked to one uh, private company, local security company, and I won't reveal who it is to protect the innocent here, but they said they didn't see one sale in the entire month of October. Not one thing closed for 30 days. They could have closed the doors, gone on vacation, come back, and it wouldn't have made a difference. Right, simply. And that's god-awful. How do you run a company when you have 30, a month of expenses, rent, salaries, all the other costs, and not a dime comes in the door? That's not good. So VCs are kind of keeping that back in their mind. We need like a rainy day fund and they want to hold on to that as long as they can and make companies to be as sustainable or self-sustainable as they can be. Um, the other problem is, too, angel investors are hard to find right now. These are the guys that put the money in at the earliest of stage, the seed investors. They used to put in 50 to 100K as an easy amount. I'm seeing the guys saying, now I'll put in 20, 25K. So they've ratcheted down their investment by 50 to 75%. So as a startup, that's kind of tough. It's like, ooh, how do I get the money to get it going? I mean, a buddy of mine is doing a startup right now. He'd raised 200K and he was, he was thrilled. He's like, I'm like, you would have gotten 500K a year ago. He's like, I know, but at least I got this much, and I got to keep going. So you got to work hard to get the money. Kind of the, the uh, not so much fun stuff there. Um, and the reason why that is, again, the overall economy, when you've lost 55% of your stock portfolio, you're less free with your cash. And the other problem is, too, people are worried. There's actually a confidence crisis out there. And we can thank well, no other than Bernie Madoff himself for doing this. So as part of my little consulting gig when I left Morgan Stanley, I wanted to create a model where I would do what I was doing at Morgan Stanley. Talk to public companies, talk to private companies, consult with them on their strategic options, their financial options, and help them raise some money. I used to do all the IPOs at Morgan Stanley. All the security IPOs I did, yes, you can yell at me about the IPOs. That was me, sorry. Um, and M&A. We did a lot of M&A in, in, in the software space. But when somebody like this bilks everybody out of 50 plus billion, now they're talking about over 100 billion dollars in the U.S. government's tally, that kind of makes you think twice about investing in anything. Especially when the guy is in his penthouse apartment in New York City, 
and his wife wants to keep 70 million bucks, right? This is kind of bad for the American psyche. So with this mentality, investors are really holding back, but it doesn't stop there. The problem is, the other thing that's going on is because cash is king, it's getting, you know, it's getting, it's not getting better tomorrow, and where's the build, sorry, my point here. The VCs need to keep both their existing investments alive, so they're not willing to throw new money necessarily, but they are putting money in. So Verico just raised five million bucks, Avexa just raised $10 million like two weeks ago. So there's still money being raised and being invested in companies. I don't think there's no money out there at all. It's just, it's hard to get. Because I'm pretty sure if it were a different environment two or three years ago, Verico would have gotten probably 10 or 15 million, not five. But the VC was saying, look, we like the business. We think it's still good, but we're only giving you five, not 10 or 15. So it's, you've got to reset your expectations there. Um, but the endowments is what, what's going on here. Like the college funds, Harvard getting whacked. Yale is getting hit. These guys were investing in venture capital funds. But now if they're down a billion or two, that money is not in the system anymore. They're pulling, that money's gone. So they're not gonna reinvest or re-up into a, a venture capital fund or a private equity fund or something that would help feed the technology ecosystem. That's kind of a bad thing. Um, but again, at the end of the day, software is getting money. I just mentioned two companies, just, I'm not taking favorites here, I just I happen to notice that Vexca and uh, Verico got money. It's not that I'm endorsing them or anything like that, but they got money. Uh, and the point of the matter is to say to you that there is data out there that shows if you're an entrepreneur or a startup or even a going concern, if you need to get cash, you can get it. It's just going to be a little bit harder. You have to work out a little bit longer. Um, the, uh, the other thing about it starting out right now today, I think, is one of the best times in the world to start a company is today. Even though it's going to take, I think, another year and a half to two years to get out of this mess we're in, that gives you two years to be able to just build a really cool company, a really cool product. Because you're not missing out on the big upside. <laughs> it's just not there. So the good news is things suck. The good news is <laughs> get more time to get your stuff ready to go. Um, it's kind of a weird way to think about it, but I really believe that fundamentally that starting up today is a, a good thing. You're ready to manage. And if you're a private company that's doing well, and there are a bunch of them here, by the way, or even a public company that's doing well, it's a great time because the competition now has to deal with this macro headwind. They have a problem. It's not because you're a better product or you have a better sales guy or you have a better whatever. It's because, hell, the VC is not going to put money in them. Or, hell, their stock price is down 70 80%. I mean, Symantec, before the Veritas deal, was 33 or 36 bucks a share. It hit 10 or 11, something like that recently. It's up to 12 or 13 now. That's a massive hit. They've got to deal with that. That kind of impacts your business plan. It certainly impacts your ability to do acquisitions because your stock is worth a third of what it once was. I think I'm not trying to pick on Symantec here. It's just the reality of the market. A CA is in the same spot. How does computer, computer sites go out and do deals with a stock price that's whacked like that? It's, it's a tough thing for them to do. So starting with a clean slate has an advantage, again, because you're not worried about some stock price that's down 50, 60, 70 percent. Or you're on your E round. And by the way, about venture capital, some of you know this very well. Once you get past the letter D, it's really not good. It's like, it's like grading in school. They got a D. Oh, crap. You got a D? Really? Oh, man. It's, I mean, at least you passed. It's not all the time. Something like D can be very good. But typically to E and F, something good is not the case. Usually it's not the case that it's a good thing because you're on life support at that point or they're trying to get you bought and nobody's bidding at a level anybody feels good about. So A through D is okay. After that, it gets a little slippery slope in general. Again, I don't want to be too blase about these comments, but um, that's kind of what's going on there. Um, uh, no bad legacy uh, with burnt down investors. Again, that DEF situation, the earlier guys get crammed out. If you're an A investor in a company that's doing an E or F round, your investment's pretty much zero, unless they get bought for a gazillion dollars. It's pretty much worthless. Um, so you as a startup, when you're doing it today, I mean, this is, you know, I'll, I'll, I will play a favor for one second. Like Ron Gula, I remember Ron and I were sitting at a conference one day, and he was literally writing on a napkin about what he, was gonna, what he wanted to do. And they, I believe, have done a very good job in managing their company. And, in fact, if you think about it that way, from the day you're putting that pen to the paper napkin, how are you going to spend every penny? If how are you going to do that intelligently? That will actually help you in so many different ways, because most startups, and I made this thing myself with the business, you tend to spend money on this idea that it's okay because we're going to have money coming in the door down the road. That's the theory. That's the business plan. You have to build that too. That's great. God bless you. It happens. I think it's wonderful. But in this environment, whatever you think is going to take you 12 months, it's going to take you 20 months. You have to think that way. And if I'm wrong, I'll gladly have you yell at me, oh, it didn't take 24. It took 12 months, Cooper. I'm like, good. Good for you. Congrats. You're doing great. Fantastic. For the guys that think it's going to take 12 and it takes 24, they're probably out of business. Or they have to do a VC round, and it's horrible to see from presentation that Rafi is going to mock me. I didn't read Rafi's book yet, obviously. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, you can see the whole point of this slide is that over time, over the last, I think I did 95 days. Yeah, 95. I went back 14 years of data, and this is PwC Money Tree data. Uh, they, they do a really good job with uh, Reuters and some other guys. 
um, where the money is going. So at the red circle there is trying to highlight that software has been grabbing on average around 25% of the annual uh, deals in VC land. So, and it's horrible to see from presentation that Rafi is going to mock me. I didn't read Rafi's book yet, obviously. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, you can see the whole point of this slide is that over time, over the last, I think I did 95, yeah, 95. I went back 14 years of data, and this is PwC Money Tree data. Uh, they, they do a really good job with uh, Reuters and some other guys. Um, where the money is going. So at the red circle there is trying to highlight that software has been grabbing on average around 25% of the annual uh, deals in VC land. So out of all the sectors, be it consumer, uh, retailing's on there, uh, energy's on there, uh, consumer products, computers, biotechnology, which is also very healthy at the bottom there, software is the big dog. So there's still money being invested in software. That's good. It's less. It was a billion dollars last quarter, down from 1.3 the year prior. So a pretty heavy cut. You lose $300 million in a quarter. That's a big hit. But it's still a billion dollars went into software last quarter alone. That's $300 million a month. That's fantastic. It's not as good as it was, but it's still very healthy. So there's still money out there. People say things are really bad. They are. But there are silver linings to this data. It's showing you right there that software is still very much in the minds of investors. They still want to invest in software. Doesn't mean they're all going to be successful. But there's still an investor appetite to go after these opportunities. And that's the problem. <laughs> we have still too many vendors. I've been using this chart for 10 years now. And when I first started doing it, there was like, um, <clears throat> and for the back of the room, you probably can't see it, but I tried to put it in basic buckets like, you know, what was then AAA, remember? Authentication, Authorization, Administration, which has been morphed three or four times. Um, and I had the other spot like um, vulnerability and management kind of stuff, and then perimeter control, just general groupings of where the companies were so I get a sense of how many companies were in each bucket. And the top right one, uh, I think it was like data leakage, more or less. I can't remember the term I used at the time. Yeah, we call it internal data security or, or application security, that kind of stuff. And when I first started the slide 10 years ago, there was really nobody up there, very few vendors. Now there's more and more. And oh, by the way, if you're not up there, nothing personal. If I haven't met with you, you're not on the slide as a general rule. And sometimes I just forget to put it on there. Uh, but you can see over time, the dollar signs show those have been acquired. So again, 10 years ago, no real dollar signs. Last couple of years, a lot of dollar signs. People get acquired all over the place. Sabari got bought by Microsoft is on there. Um, who else is on there? Um, a ton of them. You know, obviously, Foundstone got bought. ISS got bought. Bindview. Go down the line. Companies of all different shapes and sizes and plays have been acquired, but a lot have failed, too. Hightower is probably the most recent uh, example we may all know about. Just spent themselves out of business, literally. So when I say manage every penny, I don't think Hightower heard that message, or maybe I didn't tell them early enough, because they're out. They're done. And the IP got sold for very, very little money, nowhere near the tens of millions of dollars that they raised. I think they got a couple hundred K for it. Bad investment. You've got to think about how to manage your company. But the consolidation needs to happen. You're going to see more failures and more acquisitions. It's inevitable because, again, if software is shrinking, hardware is plummeting, these guys go out and do deals. Now, I'm not saying that they're going to be smart deals. Sun paying a billion dollars for MySQL, good for Mar Martin, not sure good for anybody else. A billion dollars for that database play. So you're seeing money being spent on deals. The question is the how and where are they going to do it going forward. And what I'm seeing also a little bit of a different mentality. I was talking about this at breakfast early, briefly. What I'm seeing is more and more companies are buying into a space they want to commoditize or consolidate. So look at Microsoft, what they did. They bought AV. They bought Sabari. They bought um, GCAD. What else did they buy? They bought a bunch of different things. Um, Cisco, of course, also plays in the game, right? They bought a ton of stuff over the years. And now you're seeing DLP, you're seeing all the acquisitions going on there, too. And just, again, just a splattering of the companies they, they bought. And you can add tons of companies to that slide. Don't get me wrong, it's not an exhaustive list. But what they're doing is saying, look, we want to offer a suite of services to our customers. Why? Because we can charge them higher maintenance. <laughs> Back to the maintenance slide. And because we're taking out the competition. We didn't develop a good job. We didn't develop a good, strong uh, capability at Microsoft. Okay, Microsoft Security, I think we all have a good laugh about that again. But they're spending a lot of time and a lot of money now on it, so you can't laugh anymore. Right? I mean, that's an amazing turnaround Microsoft. Give them credit. I mean, they were the laughing stock of security. And one of the surveys did at Morgan Stanley a year ago, they were either number one or number two in mind share and security. That's a fantastic turnaround. I mean, that's just amazing they could do that. But again, is anybody going to brag about Microsoft security? It doesn't matter. They're, they're buying up the property. Cisco, same thing. They're buying up a ton of capability. And now you're seeing DLP. McAfee, McAfee bought into it. Symantec bought Bond2. You even saw WebSense buy into the game with, with um, Port Authority, which was videos before, I guess. So you're seeing more and more consolidation. And I think what the, buy the buyers are actually thinking, you know what, I can go out and invest 10, 20, 30, 40 million dollars to try to build it myself. I can go out and buy the guys that are doing it now, and pay them the premium, because they did all the risk work anyway. They made it, they made it work. They perfected it more. 
they did it better than I probably could have done it. So let's go and pay these guys for a job well done. And I think you're going to see more and more of that, but smaller deals, smaller companies. So you'll see smaller VC investments between the smaller company and the acquisition size will be smaller commensurately. But as an entrepreneur, that's okay. You do it again. You have a great idea, you sell it for only 20 million bucks. Like, oh, I only got 20 million dollars. We've only raised 2 million and you held on to 50, 60% of the company, that's a good win. If you raise 20 million, you only own the 5% of the company and you sell for 20 million bucks, you get nothing. So a little different way of thinking about it. And the big guys like a Microsoft are absolutely thinking about this pharma type of model. They want to do little seed investments or little tiny investments in a bunch of different companies and whichever one hits, they're going to buy. Because I'll first write it, they're a part owner, they can actually go ahead and buy that company. So in essence, as an entrepreneur, think about that too. What are you positioning yourselves for? You position yourselves for the big kill or a near-term victory. That, that will definitely impact your business plan and your funding needs. Um, so we talk about capitulation, and I'm almost done here. We have time for Q&A, I think. Cool. Um, dark up before dawn. Everybody hears that. You know, that's one of the oldest lines in the book. Um, but there's so much, so much negative stuff out there. That's what the bounce was about yesterday in the market. There was so much negativity. The fact that Citibank said something positive was the first time in over a year. So the stock ripped. I think it was like 40% or some nonsense. I mean, everything is negative, right? Your house is down in value. Your job is on the line if you have a job. Your 401k is a 201k, that kind of silly joke, right? It's really, there's a lot of stuff that can bring you down. It really is. But on the other hand, you know, when everything is so negative, that actually tells me that we're almost at the bottom. So I'm actually getting more positive. And I was one of the biggest bears way too early, <laughs> which got me a little bit of trouble with some stocks. But I was worried about this coming, and now it's finally here. I'm actually starting to see the bottom forming. It's not here yet. I'm not saying that, but it is starting to form. So again, keep an eye on that consumer data to help me and all of us figure out when we're getting closer to it. But we're getting there. We're definitely getting there. The sentiment will change at some point. Things will get better. They will. And I know it's such a trivial thing to say, but when they go from this major corrective phase that we're in right now, of also liquidity coming out of the system, once the system rebalances, and I'm not saying we're there yet, again, we're getting there very painfully, very costly way of doing it. That's why I hate the government just propping these banks up. Let them fail. I know it's such an easy thing to say, but let these guys fail. It just it takes us longer to recover, the longer they sustain these unprofitable, basically broken banks. Let them go. Um, so at some point, again, you'll see things bottom out. Where Citibank saying it isn't, to me, an insult because I'm a taxpayer, it's actually a positive thing as an investor. So we'll get there. We're not there yet, but we're going to get there. Um, <clears throat> you know, when Bernie Madoff goes to jail, that's a good thing. I was really infuriated when they let Bernie stay in his penthouse when the judge said he was not a threat to the, the, uh, the public. He absolutely is the major threat to the public. From a psychology point of view, he is an absolute damaging, killing effect. Because people's lives got ruined by this guy. Absolutely cleaned out. Imagine putting all your money in. Hopefully, I, if you're one of these guys, I apologize for bringing this up. <laughs> like pouring acid on a wound. If you're an investor in him, you lost all your money. Literally, you wiped, you're wiped out. You have nothing. Imagine your whole life. You work your whole life. You save. And this guy, oh, he's doing 8 to 12%. This is so good. I'm such a nice, happy, conservative investor. Yeah, that money wasn't real. Sorry, it's gone. Uh, so that guy needs to go in jail. And hopefully it will happen in the next week. Uh, that will be good for sentiment as well. Uh, the world, uh, the markets across the globe are telling the politicians a very, very clear message. And that message is simply, you stink. Your plans are at best choppy, at worst, just god awful. They just don't work. I mean, Geithner, the guy, by the way, how does a guy who has tax fraud become a US treasure, uh, head of US Treasury? I don't get that one at all. If I didn't pay $5 in tax, I wouldn't be here. I mean, the slammer. This guy doesn't pay a couple hundred K and he gets promoted. I don't get this, but that's another question all to itself. He's choking on his own words. I mean, I'm not a great, I'm not a great public speaker, obviously. <laughs> Y'all being very polite. Um, he's got awful. And he's on stage telling me how he's going to help fix the financial system, the most powerful economy in the world. He's going to fix it. In a couple of weeks, I'll get back to you. Then don't come on stage. If you have nothing to say, if I had nothing to say, like I was worried, we'd have a slide up here. I was like, oh man, I have to talk for an hour without any slides? Eek. That's going to be tough. This guy had nothing to tell us. That's not good for the market sentiment. It's just not good at all. Have a plan. And by the way, if it's the wrong plan, okay. Nobody's perfect. I can understand that. Let's be cool about that and get that we're going to make mistakes. And Obama said that, and I, I totally bind to that. But what is the plan that you may screw up? Why is this guy, Guy, who's been at the New York Fed for years, all of a sudden has to figure this out now? When he was there for the Bear Stearns deal, he was there for the Lehman Brothers deal. What's going on here? Why is it taking so long? It's very frustrating. So again, that is where the markets are telling everybody why the market got whacked the way it did. And remember, when Geithner came and screwed up, the market was down, I think, 300 points that day alone. And so we're 300 points today means something. You know, a couple, when it's 14,000, it's less of an issue. When it's 6,000, it's a big issue. Um, and again, finally, I'll, I'll wrap up with this. You know, planning today will pay out huge dividends when we do recover. Again, another obvious statement, but I, I believe this wholeheartedly. I know it's tough out there. Again, whether you're a corporation, an individual, or whatever you are, 
you got to have a plan how you're going to take advantage of the situation because this is, I would say, the perfect storm, a 100-year storm, except I can only go back 70 years when we had the Depression and talk about that as only 70 years ago. We're in a similar situation. Are we in a depression? I don't know. You, let's define depression before I even make that comment. Are we in the worst economy we've been since then? We are. It is that bad. So I'm not going to try to you know, put lipstick on the pig or make everyone feel like, oh, it's over and we're good. It is very bad out there. But there are so many opportunities, again, and look at that data, the, the VC data, for example, if you're a startup. It's, that's very, I was really positive. I was really psyched when I saw that data. I was like, this is good. Look at the stock market, trying to lift off the bottom. It's not going to do it just yet, in my opinion, but it's trying at least. Yesterday was a good sign that we're getting near the bottom. So, yeah, things are bad, and they're going to stay bad for a little bit longer, but let's stay focused. Let's find the good stuff here, and I will stop rambling on and take any questions. Please. So the summary of the question is, does security matter, I guess? Is that a, uh, from the banking point of view? It matters to the banks. So um, yes, uh, but the problem is, as we all know in this room, and, and you guys know better than I do, by the way, I'm actually honored to be speaking. I should have started, but I'm very honored to be speaking today, because there are some major heavy hitters in this room. I was a little, a little bit nervous when I heard who was coming. I'm like, listen to me talk? He, right, listen to them talk. Uh, but the point of the matter is, is that um, the banks don't understand anything. Okay, so there's, there's my incredibly insightful answer. They don't know jack. And the reason is because they're not incented to know anything. The, the biggest problem with this whole meltdown, we want to boil it down to the word, I mentioned a word, deleverage. That is the qualified, or the quantified reason the shape we're in. The qualified reason the shape we're in is because there was no reason not to do it. The incentive system was such that you really weren't going to get in trouble. If you were the hedge fund guy that had 50 million bucks and you lost the $400 million, Whatever you put of your money, yeah, you lost that. But you, you unhooked the 400 million? You know, you declare bankruptcy and walk away. So, ah, damn, that was a bad trade. That's, oh, man, that was, what a bad night that was, dude. 400 million bucks. Woo. I'll start up again next year. And th there was no, like, oh, you can't do that. You shouldn't have had 400 million to begin with. Don't get me wrong. And the banks gave it to them. Morgan Stanley gave it. Morgan Stanley's a bunch of idiots. They really are. They're clueless. They, a third of their prime broker business literally got shut down because they were borrowing, these guys were borrowing so much money and could not possibly pay it back on a trade basis that Morgan Stanley had to like lose a third of their business, which, by the way, is one of the most profitable business lines. All right? So when I say bankers don't know what they're doing, I'm, I, that was kind of part of the problem, to be honest. right? But think about it from another perspective. American Express is paying people 300 bucks to close their accounts because their risk models don't work. Long-term capital management, you guys remember that one? LTCM, $140 billion of notional value they were on the hook for from writing options. Their model was based on six years of data. Does anybody in this room have a clue or idea what the typical business cycle, how long it lasts? Throw out a number. How long do you think it is? I heard 10, I heard 15. It's actually somewhere between 8 to 12 years on average, around 9.6, some nonsense like that. So you know all this. You guys know this. You're not, you're not long to, oh, the smartest guys in the room, right? They're supposed to be smarter than we are. They built the model in six years of data. They didn't even capture the tails. So of course they lost. It was inevitable they are going to lose their money. And the bankers, again, gave them money to do it. to tell us how the, to get out of this crisis. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and they have, they have seven years data now, so it's okay. So, so I'd like to argue that the banks actually do know how to manage risk very well. They took all of the upside and handed off all of the downside. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's a very good answer, yes. <laughs> but more to the point, how do we, what, one of the keys then is to say, how do we allocate risk in a way where the risk goes to the people either who can control it, who are interested in owning it, 
how do we construct incentive structures yep. so coming out of this we get better information yeah, the, security? The, the key word you said was incentive. What is the incentive to actually do risk management properly or as best as you can do? It's risk management. It's not eliminating risk. Because by the way, risk is a part of business. It's risk reward. That's the whole game. How do you balance the risk reward ratios that make sense? So again, back to that hedge fund guy, 40 million bucks. If he makes $4 million trading and doubles it to $800 million, he's getting it literally an $80 million bonus check. His risk is totally incented to go nuts and try to double the money. The downside is, if he loses it all, like you said, they just keep all the upside, they have none of the downside. Until there's a clear system where downside is, means something, we actually do get hurt, then it's not going to be fixed. And I don't care if it's a publicly traded company, be it a bank, be it any publicly traded company, be it any private company, if you can walk away from your liability, quote unquote, the risk that you made so cleanly, then no, it's not, it's not. A, and that's again why I think Bernie Madoff should have been jailed day one. I know it's, it's so silly to say, well, who cares? It's going to go eventually. It's just the psyche of Americans, you cannot do this. It's the world. You cannot, there's a downside of doing this stuff. As a CEO, if you're getting paid up front and then you leave behind all this mess, you should have to go back and give that money back. It's like the bridge example. One of my favorite little analogies is, is you know, a governor that owns, uh, that runs a state budget knows that these bridges are in tough shape. The engineering report says, you got to do at least $100 million to fix these bridges. And he's, he's up for re-election in six months. Because how long will they last? Will they last six months? Yeah, we think they will. You sure? Yeah, they'll probably last six months. Okay, good. I'll worry about it in six months. And he doesn't get reelected. It's new guy's problem. Now he gets, oh my God, these or new guy's problem. These bridges are falling apart. How long are they going to last? Six months. You sure? Not two years? Th there's no incentive to actually say, oh, by the way, the bridge falls down. What's going to happen to you as a governor? Are you going to be charged with manslaughter? No, you're going to get voted out of office. That's a, bad, that's a bad downside. But what about people making really stupid decisions for financial gain or personal gain? Where's the downside? Until you have that system in place where there actually is real penalties, then we're not going to get uh, better anytime soon. That's a great question, a great point. I, I love the, uh, the banks who had to manage risk. It's <laughs> a great way to spin it. And, and in the interest of staying on time, I think we're going to wrap it here. Okay. Um, and also, if you're watching online, don't forget to visit us at sourceconference.com for additional videos. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Thank you.